Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marvin Pendarvis, and I represent House District 113. And for those who don't know, 113 covers uh, Charleston County. So I'm in North Charleston, but it goes into Charleston County and Dorchester County as well. And so what I'm here to discuss is something that we touched on earlier, if you all recall Senator Tim Scott's presentation. And it's how we can use opportunity zones, what it's doing on the federal level, uh, but to supercharge them in a way and to ensure that on a state level we're giving investors as much incentive as possible to make sure that they benefit the communities. Uh, one of the things that I've learned in my research, uh, I represent a district where about a third of my district is in an opportunity zone. And one of the questions that I'm asked often, and even through my research and conversations with people who are experts in the field, is how do we make sure that opportunity zones are not the fast track to gentrification? Or to put it otherwise, how do we make sure we're not subsidizing displacement? And one of the things that I've realized that we could do is, uh, as a state, is push forward legislation that makes sure that we take that into account, that ensures that we're working with investors, but more importantly, we're having that community buy-in that you all heard so much earlier as far as what kind of stake the investors are having in these projects. And so what we've done over the time that I've been in office, I introduced a, some, some legislation earlier this year, House Bill 3186, uh, dealing with that. And I'll touch on it a little bit later, but I want to start off by just talking about generally opportunity zones. Now, I think there's a clicker up here. Yep. So many of you probably already know what opportunity zones are, which is why you're here. And we know it's a revitalization tool and when done the right way, we have an opportunity, pun intended, to transform our communities in some meaningful way. But the question becomes, uh, how do we get there? Or what tools are available at the state level? And what can we do at the state level to further incentivize our municipalities and investors to take advantage of opportunity zones and making sure that we're maximizing the impact that we're having on these communities? In other words, how do we ensure economic benefit for the people that Opportunity Zones intend to, uh, to benefit? Now, just to give you a little bit of statistics that I've been able to uncover during my research, uh, across the country there are about 10 million Americans that live in Opportunity Zones. Uh, 1.8 of those Americans, I'm sorry, 10 million Americans living in poverty that are in Opportunity Zones. 1.8 of those Americans in Opportunity Zones are unemployed and about 21 million people of color live in the Opportunity Zones. And so, as you heard Senator Scott mention earlier, we've got a pro the reason that these Opportunity Zones are so important is because we're dealing with communities that have historically been distressed, uh, that have historically not seen the kind of investment that the people there need, and that have historically needed the attention uh, from so many benefactors, whether it be the state, whether it be the municipalities, or whether it be um, an interested investor who has an eye on making sure that that community is sustainable for the long term. And so we see a stark contrast, honestly, between the communities that have been designated as opportunity zones and the investors that are seeking to create the funds and actually go into these communities. And so the question is, how do we balance that? How do we make sure it's equitable for the investor, ensuring that they go in getting the benefit that they seek when they created the fund and that, they're, they, that uh, when they, the time that they're done um, holding the investment, that they're able to get something out of it? But in addition, how do we make sure that the communities have some real benefit? And so that takes me to House Bill 3186. Now, it's a multi-part approach that I've taken uh, with the legislation that we've introduced. This is a bill that's currently pending in the House of Representatives as it relates to Opportunity Zones. And I took it upon myself to reach out to some experts in the field because I realized that South Carolina had a number of things on the books already that were that were tools that investors could use that could be catalysts for investment in these communities, uh, particularly in opportunity zones. And a few of those I want to highlight here that are unrelated to the legislation that I introduced, but that were already on the books, but we hadn't been looking at how we could use those. 
Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with the local prospectus grants that are issued by the South Carolina Department of Commerce. In addition to the textile community right of revitalization tax credit, the angel investors tax credit, and then lastly, in something that's also pending, uh, the low income housing tax credit. That's House Bill 3998 that I was a co-sponsor along with um, someone who's familiar to Greenville. Many of you probably know Bruce Bannister. He and I co-sponsored that bill, House Bill 3998. And that's a low income housing tax credit that essentially gives um, a similar tax credit to the federal tax credit here on the state level. And so what does all of that mean? Um, what am I trying to get at? Well, as I said before, uh, the biggest thing is if we're going to use opportunity zones to invest in our communities, we've got to give, or to benefit our communities and to uplift our communities, we've got to give investors and developers every tool as, as much as possible to be able to do that. And I think us giving them as many incentives through tax legislation, I'm no tax expert, I've had conversations with many people who are, and what I've been told is, if you're able to go into an area that's already been designated an opportunity zone, um, there are an additional credits that can be available to you that we could use on a state level. Uh, the second part of that, that House Bill 3186, is the community benefit. Now, many of you have already heard the conversation with our esteemed panelists that have been before me, and there was a constant theme that resonated through each of their conversations which said that many of them want to do projects, many of them want to go into communities, but they want to make sure they're doing it in a way that the community benefits, that the people who live there recognize that this investor is not coming in to further displace, but comes in with an eye toward doing something that's mutually beneficial for all parties involved. So that can be done, but it takes thought and it's going to take our state to recognize it. And it's not a novel concept. Uh, you heard Senator Scott Rich, uh, talk about it earlier. There are a number of states that are already doing this um, across the country. Maryland is one of them. In fact, Maryland is probably the one that's a leader, if I would say, across the country in how they've used opportunity zones. Governor Hogan there essentially used the word supercharged in his state address talking about what he wanted to do with opportunity zones. And so that prompted me to have a conversation with uh, Governor McMaster and, and members of his administration talking about what we can do as a state. If South Carolina is winning, let's make sure that we use every tool in our toolkit to make sure the investors are doing everything that they can to truly impact these communities, to truly lift it. If we say a rising tide lifts all boats, let's make sure that we're making that tide as best as possible. Let's make sure that we're giving every tool that's available. And so what I've learned through my research in Maryland, uh, as you saw, that some of the things that they're doing that's successful, they're using strategic plans to address affordable housing, uh, the loan financing, work development in the form of jobs, based on incentives you heard, conversations about tax increment financing, TIFs, something that local municipalities often use. Uh, there are a number of approaches that states across the entire country are using uh, in order to do that. And one of the ones that I think is a, as I said, Maryland is doing it, Virginia, West Virginia, Alabama, uh, there are a number of states that are doing good things. And so I think we have a unique opportunity in South Carolina uh, to follow the lead, to follow the model of uh, states that have been successful in this, but really be a leader in enacting meaningful legislation that's truly going to benefit these communities. I've always um, been one to believe that if we truly, you know, progress doesn't come because we wish for it. It comes because we work for it. And in order for us to get there, we've got to put in the work and we've got to surround ourselves with the people that are going to do the work and, and to be able to make sure we enact meaningful legislation. And so that's what I'm hoping to do by this, um, to give you a little bit of an outline about what's going to be pre-filed this December. We've got a pre-filing date of December 11th which will be when legislation for the 2020 session will be filed in order for us to be able to take it up on January the 13th when we come back. And I used the bill that I referenced earlier, House Bill 3186, uh, but we went back to the drawing board and really looked at what can we do to, be a, to make it a comprehensive approach to address housing, uh, to address jobs, 
to address the food deserts that are in these opportunity zones, and to make sure there's transparency and accountability. Those are the important things. Those are what came up in conversations with not only investors, but also members of the community, in addition to other state leaders across the country that have examined the issue and then have taken it upon them to do something about it. And so if you'll, you'll take a look at the South Carolina uh, Opportunity Zone Enhancement Act, and I, it's on one of my, um, I'll go back to the slide here, the South Carolina Opportunity Zone Enhancement Act, one of the things that, there are several tenets of it. It addresses housing in a sense that we're going to look at the low-income housing tax credit, a bill that's currently on there, but taking it a step further for those who invest in Opportunity Zones a job tax credit ensuring that if we're going to go into these communities, we're creating additional jobs, sales tax rebates for people, uh, for entities that come in and try to address our food desert problem. One of the things that, I've, that have come up in my research that many of these opportunity zones, you've got, you know, they're within miles, and in some instances, especially in my district, of the nearest grocer. And so, you know, the research has been, been evident about the impact that the lack of food can have on a community. Um, I think this is a real good chance for us to do something about it and also benefit our communities and make sure that we're still taking care of the spirit of the law. And then there's grant programs. We've got to make sure that we're able to put funding into this, programs that are going to help people get jobs, programs that are make sure that we address housing, programs that are going to be comprehensive in nature and addressing what we believe are many of the issues that lead to poverty in the opportunity zones. And then lastly, and one of the things that the governor really um, liked as far as our presentation that we gave to them on what we wanted to do is the task force. Um, what has been successful in the many states, particularly you know, the District of Columbia, uh, Maryland, Virginia, Alabama, that have taken this on, is they've created a task force that essentially is comprised of uh, elected leaders, um, people in commerce in that particular state, and different investors looking at what the states can do in order to really come up with a program that's going to be beneficial for the state, looking at it as a holistic approach, getting all the parties together, coming up with a database to keep track of these projects. That's the direction that we're going. That's the direction that this legislation can take us. And I'm hoping and I'm, I'm very optimistic about our opportunity to be able to put this in place in 2020. We've got a finite period of time between now and then really to deal with this entire legislation. We know in, in 2026, that'll be the time when many of the incentives will be, be um, up uh, as far as what you could take advantage of. And then later down the road, I believe 2046 is when you have many people coming up with exit strategies as far as the phasing out of the, the opportunity zones. It's not something that's intended to last forever because the goal is to improve communities. It's to uplift our communities and provide some tangible benefits for the people and the businesses that are there. And so in the time that we, are, that, that, that we have this beautiful legislation in front of us, uh, we've got to be mindful. We've got to be committed to making sure that we give investors every tool possible in order to address the many issues that are in opportunity zones. And I'll leave you with this. Um, I, similar to many of the stories you heard, I grew up, uh, as I said, in North Charleston. And in the district that I grew up is a district that was uh, ravaged with poverty. Uh, there's a lot of crime. There's uh, things going on there that I could have either gone to the, the route that I did, going to college and law school and, and doing the, you know, the things that I've been blessed to do in life where I could have been in jail or I could have been dead or sold drugs and doing some of the things that so many of my peers have done. And I say that to you because in these communities, uh, there are people that are looking for hope. There are people that are looking for opportunity. There are people that are looking for something to latch on to in order for them to have to be success. And I think it's incumbent upon us as elected leaders, as people who are coming to these communities, to do everything that we can to lift these communities up. When you address housing, when you address jobs, when you address uh, the healthy lifestyle and, and making sure people have proper food to eat, you address many of the issues that are in these communities. You improve education, you improve the educational outcomes, you improve the quality of life, you, you ensure that people are able to climb up the economic ladder to have success in life. But we've got to start somewhere. I'm very thankful for Senator Scott and Senator Booker for creating this legislation and birthing it and putting it in place. But as many states have shown, 
uh, while we wait on the federal, I mean, the Treasury Department to come up with more and more regulations, we can be very proactive on a state level on how we address this. And I think if we do that, we'll see ourselves doing a good deed for many of the communities um, that are within the opportunity zones. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here.